Hi, my name is Kevin Callahan and I'm the discipleship pastor here at Woodland Hills Church. We'd like to let you all know about our intensive discipleship program called SOMA, our School of Missional Apprenticeship. SOMA is an intensive nine-month seminary for everybody where students are involved in daily classes, hands-on ministry, urban missional service, and deep transformative community. The program is designed for adults of all ages and focuses on personal healing, spiritual growth, and practical equipping. This fall we're kicking off our second year of SOMA and we'd like to invite you to consider whether this is something that Jesus may be calling you to. Or maybe you know someone else that it would be a good fit for. Either way, you can find out more at whchurch.org SOMA. We hope you'll join us in this deep dive about forming ourselves into more Jesus-looking people and Jesus-looking communities that manifest Jesus' beautiful kingdom around the world. Again, the web address is whchurch.org slash SOMA. Thanks so much. I brought the towel this morning, so you know it's going to be hot. Uh, me and humidity don't get along. We got these hot lights up here. For service, I was just like <sighs> gushing all out, so I came prepared. You got the towel. If I get really feisty and stuff, you guys might get a little water on you. I'm just going to warn you. It's, it, it, it's coming. It's coming. You know, when the, the, the warm-up question that we had was, how do you stay cool? And... and I tell people it comes naturally. I, I, I don't. <laughs> Babu Ching! All right. Um, actually, it doesn't come naturally. Seven degrees and I start sweating. Um, I, let me say the word about SOMA, our School of Missional Apprenticeship. Uh, uh, it's a year out of your life, or nine months, spent in this intentional community where you minister to one another. It's educational. I, polity, a number of the people teach regularly at this school. Um, and you do mission together. It, it's, it's as close to a New Testament kind of church as most people are ever going to get. Um, and, and so I, I encourage, uh, especially younger people if, if, who are getting to, maybe think we're going to college. Um, and parents, I encourage you to think, consider this as a possibility to steer your kids in this direction. I taught college for a lot of, if I still do. Uh, and I'm telling you, most freshmen aren't, shouldn't be there. <laughs> They're not ready for it. You're paying 35 grand or whatever, and 90% and of it's going down the toilet. Give them a year, get them kingdomized, like nothing will kingdomize you like this, this, this SOMA school. And now everything else they do will be more kingdom because of it. And they matured a year and they'll get more out of school or whatever. This idea that you have to, everyone's supposed to go to college right away. I just think we should call that into question. Um, not, you know, or, or, or trade school, whatever. Take a, the Mormons got it right. Man, take a year or two out and, and do some kingdom work, what they consider kingdom work. I'm not saying going knocking on doors or anything, all right? But I'm, I, join this community. Be a part of it. Pray about it, all right? And if you're interested, um, you can check out more about that online. So we're in a series that we're calling Long Story Short because we're looking at a lot of the short stories of the Bible that are really important turning points in the biblical narrative. And we're doing it for the purpose of trying to get a, picture, a sense of the long story, the overall picture. We're trying to connect the dots. Uh, have the pieces fall into place. And uh, so we can get the overall storyline, the, the narrative uh, of the Bible. And in particular, we're looking at the themes of covenant and kingdom. Because um, that really is the thread that weaves it all together. Uh, and the pattern that we find throughout the Bible is that when, when we keep covenant with God, when we're rightly related to God, which is what the Bible means by being righteous, we're, we're, we're rightly related with God, we'll be rightly related with ourselves, right related with all other people, and rightly related to the earth and the animal kingdom that we've been entrusted to care for. But when we break covenant with God, when we're not rightly related with God, when we're not righteous, then we're not going to be rightly related to ourselves or with other people or the earth and the animal kingdom. And when the human collective isn't rightly related with God, uh, well, we saw last week that disaster happens. We've been entrusted with the earth and the animal kingdom, and when we're not rightly related with God, we bring destruction on the earth and the animal kingdom. Uh, the kingdom of God, w w when we're rightly related with God, it always leads to life, and the kingdom of God is always about life because God is life, and his will gets done on earth as it is in heaven. But when we go in the opposite direction, it leads towards death, and it leads towards destruction, and we saw that happen with the flood. So today we're going to look at uh, the, the calling of Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I always felt like girls kind of got short changed on that song. I, I just feel like it's... But children doesn't work either, so someone come up with a new Abraham song. Uh, before we look at the, the calling, I, I, I want to uh, point out a shift that's happening here. This is a, a decisive, one of the most decisive turning points in the Bible. Um, up to this point, in Genesis 1 through 11, the, the focus has been on the world as a whole and on humanity as a whole. So it's been a, a global perspective. 
But starting in chapter 12, starting here, the, the narrative zeroes down to one person and then their descendants leading up to, to Jesus. It, 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 it becomes very narrow. So it's a tremendous uh, shift that goes on there. And um, Genesis 1 through 11 was basically about humanity as a whole, how we, how we just seem to be bent on destroying ourselves, bringing destruction on ourselves. But 12 on is now about God pursuing us and trying to save us from ourselves and to restore us. Uh, 1 through 11, uh, it culminates in, 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 in chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel, uh, which is just kind of a sign that sin drives us apart and we're scattered throughout, throughout the globe. Uh, starting with chapter 12, God's going to zero in on the one storyline that, that will eventually bring all the people groups together again and, and be under his lordship. Um, so it, we're, we're really zooming in here, which means that we're not going to hear much about what else God is doing around the globe. We, we, all the attention now is going to be focused on this one storyline. And you can get the impression sometimes, reading the Old Testament, that that God plays favorites, that God is, it just doesn't care about those other nations, that God loves Israel more than those other nations. And I've even heard preachers preach that, that, that only, only Israel could be saved, all those other pe- people and all those other nations are lost, because these are the chosen people. And that used to, I always thought that was just a tremendously unfair, you know, you know, it's not your fault for being born where you're born, why would God punish you for that? But, but th- you can get that impression. God's a parochial, tribal God. And in fact, there are portraits of God in the Old Testament that look very much like the tribal gods of the other nations, these nationalistic deities, these warrior deities who fight on behalf of one nation against the others. You get portraits of God like that in the Old Testament because that's how a lot of people viewed God. And God does not lobotomize people's brains to get them to think true thoughts. He bears their sin. He accommodates where they're at, including how they, how, how they view him. But sometimes uh, in the Old Testament, you'll have, uh, you know, it says that they saw things, through, they got glimpses of the truth. Uh, it, the sun was out, but there's a lot of clouds. The clouds being their old cultural conditioning and whatnot. So, so there's a lot of clouds in the Old Testament, but sometimes that sun breaks through and you get pure revelation. And there's little hints that we get, little reminders throughout the, 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 the biblical witness that tell us that while the focus is on this one storyline, God is also very active all over the place with other nations. He's always been the God of the whole world. He's always been the God who loves all the people of the world. So for example, uh, Amos chapter 9. Verse 7, the Lord says this, do, do not you Israel, Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt, the Philistines up from Kephtor, and the Arameans from Kerr? Incredible passage. All the more incredible because it goes against so much of the perception you get in other parts of the biblical narrative, and it certainly goes against everything you find in the ancient Near East. No one had a conception of a God who is equally for all people. This is unprecedented. And so what he's saying here is, is that, you know, yes, you Israelites, I love you, and I chose you for a special purpose, but I also love, the, I, I love you the same way I love the Cushites. And yeah, I brought you up out of Egypt, and that was wonderful, and I always want you to remember that. But I also brought the Philistines up from uh, Kaftor when they were in captivity and the Arameans up from Kerr. Maybe it was the other way around, I don't remember. But, but, but these, are, these are nations that were Israel's enemies at different times. And what God is saying is, you know, whenever some people are, are being oppressed or injustice or enslaved, I'm going to be there delivering them, even if they're your enemies. I know you think that you own me and I'm only fighting on your side, but you know what? I'm actually for everybody who's, who's under the thumb of somebody else. Uh, he's a God who's always working at all times with all people because he's a God who created and loves all the people that he made equally. But we're only told a very narrow storyline. And the reason the focus is on the storyline is because this is the storyline that, that God will use to ultimately redeem all the storylines. Um, Jesus said that, that, that the uh, kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It starts off it's very, very, very tiny, but when it grows, it takes over the whole garden. Uh, so also the kingdom of God always starts small. God, oh, this is his program. He starts with a tiny, tiny thing. He works from the small to the large. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. The mustard seed is going to take over the whole ground, uh, garden. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of God's mustard seed operation. This is how God's going to save the world. He goes from the particular to the general. His focus is always on the world as a whole, but, but he starts with one, and that one person is Abraham. Abraham. This is the start of Operation Mustard Seed. So let's look at the call. Genesis chapter 12. You find a very similar call in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17, but they all say basically this. 
The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Just remember that. He says, leave your father's household. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. There's a whole lot in this for Abraham. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And look at this. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So note just right at the start here that the bullseye is all the peoples of the world. That's what God's aiming at. But he's going to get there by, choosing, by calling out Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Walk with me and I'm going to bless you. I'll build my kingdom through you. Um, but the reason I'm going to bless you is so you can be a blessing to others. It is a fundamental kingdom principle that if you're blessed, enjoy it and use it to bless others. Uh, one of the reasons why we're blessed is to bless others. And so God's saying here, the bullseye is the world. That's what he's going at. But uh, there's two questions I want to ask here. Uh, the, 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 the first is, it seems like a benign question, but in fact, it's very controversial. So get ready. Um, and I'm just going to share my opinion on this, uh, which happens to be correct in this, in this instance. <laughs> the, the question is, who are the descendants of Abraham? Who are the descendants of Abraham? Now, if you're thinking biologically, duh, it's obvious, it's the children of Israel. Abraham begot Isaac, and he became Jacob, and they, Jacob's name was turned to Israel, and everyone after that's called Israel, okay? So, so it's, it's the children of Israel, the nation of Israel. And if you think that, that biology is, is, is the important point here, if that tells the whole story, and there's a lot of Christians that do, then you might come to the conclusion, and there's millions of Christians who believe this, that that covenant that God made with Abraham is still in effect, because the Jews are still around. And, and, and you might come to the conclusion then that um, those who bless that Jewish nation will be blessed, and those who curse that Jewish nation will be cursed. And there are millions of Christians in America today who are constantly putting pressure on the government to have an unconditional, unilateral favoritism towards Israel in the hopes that it will come back on us, we'll be blessed. And some claim that the reason we are blessed is because we tend to have a favorable stance towards Israel. And... Um, uh, but, but to not do that is, is to bring about a curse on yourself. And they argue that, that because this covenant is still in effect, that all the land that God promised Abraham, Israel has by divine right. And so there are millions of Christians who have put pressure on government officials um, to oppose the two-state solution, any two-state solution. In 2010, Pat Robertson, God bless him, uh, but he, had 30, he claimed to have 30,000 signatures of Christians who were in opposition to a two-state solution, which creates this sort of ironic and sad situation where you've got Christians who are called to be the peacemakers of the earth opposing any possible peace process in the Middle East. What's wrong with this picture? If you believe this, I respect you, I understand why you believe it, that's fine, but I would just make one request, but I'd make it with an urgency, and that is, uh, please, however you cash out this belief, please put... Jesus is called to be a peacemaker as a higher priority than your interpretation of this passage. Because we who are called to be peacemakers should never be blocking any peace process. Peace is a good in and of itself. And, 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 and so getting people to work together and compromise becomes very essential. See, th th this interpretation makes total sense if you're thinking biologically. But see, if, if we interpret everything in Scripture through, through the lens of Jesus, which, which Jesus tells us to do, which Paul did, for example you see something a little bit deeper than biology, I think. Paul saw something very deep. Um, he, he, look how he interprets this promise. Now, this comes actually out of Genesis 17, where the Lord says, I, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to bless your seed. Uh, Paul sees, sees this in Galatians 3. He says, the promise were, were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture, referring to Genesis 17, does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. So Paul here is saying that the seed that was promised to Abraham, you're going to have a seed, that didn't refer first and foremost to Isaac. It rather referred to Jesus. Jesus is, that whole thing there was to, to, to bring, out, bring the Messiah into this world, this whole history of Israel, to bring the Messiah into the world, and he is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. What God was promising Abraham is essentially Abraham, through you, I'm going to bring the Messiah into the world. And through that Messiah, you're going to have many children. And through that Messiah, 
Uh, you know, I'm going to further my, my purposes in this world. And through, that, through that Messiah, you're going to be a blessing to all the peoples of the world. That's what Paul's seeing. He doesn't see it in biological categories at all. He's seeing it in theological categories. Now, if Paul's trying to argue that Jesus is this fulfillment, uh, this Messiah, on the basis of the singularity of the word seed in Genesis 17, that's a pretty weak argument. And the reason is because seed can be singular or plural. It's like our word sheep. It can mean one sheep or a lot of sheep. It can be singular or plural, so you can't leverage anything on the, fact, on the possibility of it being singular. It'd be a bad argument. But I don't think that's what Paul's doing. Uh, I think what Paul's rather doing is this. He believes that Jesus fulfills everything in the Old Testament. He is convinced of that. He, it comes out in his letters in all sorts of different ways. It's all found in Jesus. And what he's, I think, doing is he's not arguing from the text to prove Jesus. He's arguing from Jesus to highlight the text. And he's saying, now that we know that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, that he is the seed of Abraham, now look back here. It becomes significant that this can be interpreted in the singular as seed. And since we know Jesus is the fulfillment of this, it must be singular. That's what, what, what's going on here. But see, for Paul, the promise is fulfilled in Jesus. And then when anyone believes like Abraham believes, and Paul holds up in Romans 4, Abraham is the father of the faithful, to, to just not trust in works, but just to have faith, just keep on having faith. Um, that when anyone has that kind of faith towards Jesus, uh, they are now incorporated into Jesus. And since Jesus is the seed, you now become the seed. You become a descendant of Abraham. So for example, in Galatians 3, verse 28 and 29, a passage we read a lot around here because it's so beautiful and so little manifested in the church today. But he says, in Christ, he's talking about in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ. The oneness that we have in Christ is such that it renders insignificant whether you're a Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, or whatever. And then he says, if you belong to Christ, which you do by having faith, then you, you are Abraham's seed, because you're in the seed. You're in Jesus Christ. And therefore, you're heirs according to the promise. The, 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 the descendants of Abraham are all who believe as Abraham believed. And you get this in a lot of different ways in Paul. Um, he says at one point you know, that the, the true descendant of Abraham isn't, isn't necessarily one who's circumcised in the flesh, but you're circumcised in the heart. He, he gives it a spiritual uh, sort of definition. And it's why he is always insisting, it's emphatic in all of his letters, that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Not any longer. Not, not for the believer. Not if you're in Christ. So, for example, he says this in Romans 3. Um, the righteousness, the right relatedness to God, yourself, and others, that is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Therefore, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Look, at if, if your right relatedness to God, self, and others depends totally on the right relatedness of God, which you get by faith, then there's, there's no right relatedness associated with being a Jew or a Gentile. It all comes through Christ, and therefore, there's nothing left open. Uh, to, uh, you know, no need to have anything fulfill it. it it's, it's rendered insignificant. It's, it, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Or again, in uh, Galatians 6, he says this. I love this passage. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. And circumcision and uncircumcision here are just standing words for Jew and Gentile. It doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. Love it. What counts is the new creation. Uh, yeah, I hope you've heard me talk on 2 Corinthians 5, uh, this new creation, because when Paul says new creation, open your eyes, man. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful concept. In Christ, there is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything is new. And see, that's why, since we're in Christ, and all right relatedness comes through Christ, and all the distinctions and divisions and hierarchies and ranking systems and judgments that the world has are supposed to be insignificant to us, because the only thing that matters is the new creation. So we're not to see the world in terms of you fit into this category, that category, over here in this file, or you're up here, or you're down here, or you're with me, or you're out, or you're inside or out, or us versus them, and all that stupidity that makes the world go around. It's, we're, we're, we're to learn how to look past that. And what we see and the only thing we are to see is a person for whom Jesus died and therefore a person who's got unsurpassable worth. That is the new creation. Amen. See the world in terms of the new creation. So we're to be a people who aspire to put off all judgment and just see 
uh, and agree with God about the worth of every individual that, 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 that we come in contact with. And everything else is rendered uh, null and void. It's just in insignificant. And then Paul says, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. The rule about seeing everything in terms of the new creation, not in terms of male, female, black, white, all those divisions. And see, there'll be peace and mercy if you follow that rule because all of the world's conflict and all the hostility, all the hatred, all the venom, all the killing, all the violence, all of that is caused by all the categories that we put on people and all the ranking systems and files and I'm in this nation and you're in this nation and I have this ideology, you have all this me versus you. That's what causes all the violence in this world. But if there's a people who just opt out of that entire system, who don't see the world through the grid that the society gives you, there you will find peace and there you will find mercy because there you will not find grids and judgments. <laughs> We're done eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're eating of the tree of life, praise God. And so the new creation here, you see it all just through the lens of the cross. And then Paul says, finally goes, the Israel of God. The Israel of God are all the who follow this rule. The Israel of God are all who see the world in terms of this new creation. The Israel of God are all who are in Christ Jesus, who is the seed. And that's why Paul calls you the Israel of God, because you're the, the spiritual descendants of Abraham, whom Paul regards as the true descendants of Abraham. The Israel of God is be the one where you find peace and mercy, because you don't find judgment and categorizing and ranking systems. Hallelujah. So if, if, if this is the Israel of God, according to Paul, and this, by the way, is I think what, what Paul means in, in Romans 11 when it says all Israel will be saved. I don't think he's saying all the nation of Israel, this physical descent, will be saved. But all those who are in Christ will be saved. Because uh, we have a relationship with Christ and that is what, what, what salvation actually is. And so if it's all fulfilled in Jesus and all fulfilled now in the Israel, spiritual Israel that God's creating here uh, through Jesus and all who believe in Jesus... I don't see any reason to keep on thinking that there's something left to be fulfilled with this property over there in the Middle East. I, I just think God's gotten out of that real estate business. Uh, he, he, that was for a purpose. Uh, it, it, it led to the birth of the Messiah. But now, see folks, I think we're in a kingdom that transcends all of that. See, God loves Israel, yes, and, God, and we are to love Israel, absolutely. Absolutely. But that's because God loves all the nations of the world and all the peoples of all the nations. And so we are to love all the nations of the world and all the peoples of the nation. And, and I don't know. I don't know what plan God might have for Israel. And I, because I don't know what plan God might have for America or any other nation. And neither do you or, and neither does anybody. Those are the things of God. God's always at work doing stuff, but I can't parse that all out. I don't know how he's operating, whatever. But the one plan I do know about and the one plan I care about is God's plan to redeem the world in Jesus Christ. That's the one I want to be invested in right there. That's the plan. And the only kingdom that, that I'm really concerned with and that I want to live for, it's not the kingdom of America or the kingdom of Israel or the kingdom of China or Russia. It's the kingdom of God, praise God. And all who believe in it are part of that kingdom. And that kingdom transcends all of our national borders, all of our false identities, all of our files, all of our systems, all of our hierarchies, nationality, color, culture, all that. It transcends all that and encompasses all that's good about all that. But it means you can't, you can't pin what God's up to to one particular nation or one particular people group or, or anything, it transcends that. And so, so our, our job is to put off the side his judgments and just welcome everybody equally as brothers and sisters in Christ. Somebody say amen to that. Yeah. Amen. I'll tell you, th 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 this is why I've had a few people tell me that I get on a hobby horse on racism. And here's why. It's because racism is a particularly demonic Antichrist sin, because it goes to the core, the very core of the gospel. The gospel is about this new way of being, this new way of including, this new way of growing together. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's about living free from, uh, it's about obeying the rule, <laughs> and, 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 and to have nothing matter but the new creation. Uh, praise God. And it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful kingdom. And it, it, racism cuts to the core of that. It just, you see how antichrist it is. It just reintroduces the most hateful divisions you can have or any kind of prejudice and discrimination. It takes that hatefulness, and when Christians embrace it, it just sucks everything that's good out of the gospel. Not everything that's good, but the core of it, the core of it, I hope that we can see this. If you belong, if you believe in Jesus, have faith like Abraham, you're part of a community that, that is, is to be having us without of them, praise God. Okay, so second question then is this. Who, why did God choose Abraham? You're going to narrow. See, you have trillions of storylines going on throughout history, individuals and nations and all of that. And, and out of all those, God now is going to focus on one. Why? Why this one? 
Here it's important to remember what we don't know, and that's always important to remember because that's the first thing we always forget. <laughs> it's true. Remember what you don't know. Uh, we're told what happened. We're not told what else could have happened. For example, it's possible. It's possible that Abraham was the 17th person that God called out, and he was the first one who said yes. You ever think about that? We know how things went down. We don't know how else they could have gone down. What would happen if he would have said no? You ever wonder what would happen if Mary would have said no? I mean, who knows? It's kind of fun to think about. I want to write a book someday. What else could have happened? Um, <laughs> they'll probably have to wait till I'm to the other side. But, but uh, it, so you know, here's, a, here's something that's interesting that I find it interesting anyways. Um, four verses before chapter 12, the last four verses of, of, of Genesis 11, um, it talks about how Tehran, who was Abraham's father, left Ur, it was Tehran who left Ur, not Abraham, left Ur and headed for, the, the, for Canaan, the promised land. But he stopped at Hebron and stayed there for some reason. He settled there, it says. Now, some scholars have, have looked at that and have wondered this. Since God later on called Abraham out of Hebron to go to Canaan, could it be that God had initially called Tehran to come out of Ur and go into Canaan, but for whatever reasons, Tehran got sidetracked. He's got free will. Whatever happened, who knows, but he settles there. Maybe he was just going to take a little vacation, but instead he stayed there permanently. So now God has to call his son out. That might have been how it went down. It's possible. Um, I don't know why else he would leave Ur. It doesn't tell us, but it's, it's very coincidental if he wasn't called out and was going. Why else was he going to Canaan? Hey, let's go visit there. I hear there's a lot of nice Canaanites. Uh, it could be that he was called out. In any case, why did, he, why did God call Abraham? We don't know. But you might be tempted, if, especially if you were raised in a typical American Sunday school class where we tend to moralize everything. There's always a moral lesson in every story. You might have been taught that Abraham was chosen because he was the most righteous man in the land. And, and, and God always uses, you know, the righteous people to do the really important stuff. And, and since getting this Operation Rescue mission off the ground is pretty important, Abraham must have been super righteous. It just follows, doesn't it? See, there's nothing in the narrative that suggests that at all. In fact, and I love this about the Bible, the very first story it tells about Abraham, very first story, there's this yay moment where it's, I'm going to call you, make you a great nation. Now let's talk about you a little bit. First story, Abraham and Sarah go down to Egypt because there's a famine in their land and they need some food. And they, apparently Sarah was pretty hot because all the guys were looking at her, including the Pharaoh. And Abraham here is thinking, well, pharaohs get to have whatever they want. And he knows that I'm the husband of this hot gal here, that he's going to kill me just so he can get to her. So how about if I give you away free? Uh, 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 say that you're my sister, he says to, to, to his, his wife. You're my sister, and go ahead and, and sleep with him. That way I won't get killed. What a stand-up guy. That's righteousness, right? Bam, bam. That's righteous. And if that's not bad enough, the dude does it again five or six chapters later. It's like, what is with it? Get a picture of this. Abraham, Sarah, come into Egypt because they're looking for some food. Pharaoh meets them. This didn't really happen, but it's paraphrased. Pharaoh says, hey, you guys, have some food. Sit back and relax. Uh, hey, Abraham, who's this really beautiful woman that you're with? I certainly hope she's not your wife. And he goes, no, 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 that's my sister. <laughs> Feel free. Thank God. Uh, this is not good. This is not good. Whatever God's reasons for choosing Abraham were, I'm quite certain it wasn't because he was spectacularly righteous and a great husband. <laughs> but see, I, that makes me happy because, see, if God could use a loser husband like Abraham of this death, there's hope for you and me, praise God. He can use you and me. That's what I love most about the heroes of the Bible. They all have their screw-ups, except for Jesus. They all have their screw-ups, and the Bible just puts them out there. It doesn't try to tidy things up or anything. You know, Noah, found favor in the eyes of God, the one righteous man left, saves the animals, gets off the ark, and what does he do? He gets stoned drunk, passes out naked, which I don't blame him. He was in the, if you were locked up with animal poop for a year, you'd probably do the same thing. But uh, um, then he curses his son. That's not good parenting. It's just, and, and Moses, you know, he, he murders a guy, and then he's got some temper tantrum issues. And David, he's got all the women that he wants, but he's got to go after Bathsheba. That was a major disaster. Elijah calls down fire from heaven because he can. He's got that power, and he incinerates 100 people, only to find out that the Lord actually wanted him to go with these people to, to, to visit this king. A major screw up there. 100 guys paid for it. And Samson is an idiot. Samson's got the... 
temperament of a, of, of a five-year-old disturbed child with the hormones of a 16, 17-year-old guy. And he messes everything up. Yet these are the kind of people that God uses, praise God. God, God. God doesn't reject them. He uses them in their brokenness. See, it's the same as us. It's the same with us, you guys. James says we are struggling. We stumble continually. And see, there's one thing I know about you. I maybe don't know you very well. Maybe I don't even, maybe we've never even met. But I do know this about you. Well, I know Jesus Christ and him crucified. But the reason I know Jesus Christ and him crucified is because I know that you are a sinner. Amen. You screw up. You've screwed up. Now, maybe it's a little screw up by social standards. We little screw up. Or maybe it was a big screw up. Maybe it was an apocalyptic screw up. Maybe you or someone listening on podcast right now, you're sitting in the mother of all screw-ups. And it's a pile of pain for you and a pile of pain for everyone else. And it looks irreparable. Maybe that's where you are right now. See, I want to tell you, if, 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 if that's you and to all the screw-ups listening, I want to say, welcome, welcome, welcome to the first, to the beloved community of royal screw-ups. <laughs> The beloved community, you fit right in here. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, and we stand in a long tradition of screw-ups going all the way back to our father Abraham who got the ball rolling royally, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's that ought to be our name, you guys. I mean, come on, Woodland Hills. Where's the wood? Where's the hills? But I can show you a lot of screw-ups, right? The name fits. But see, if you're a screw-up and you think that, 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 that now you're out of the game, you're a screw up, and, 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 and now, now you got to be on the sidelines. Now you got to be second class. Now God can't really use you. Look what you've done. Uh, I, I want you to think again. Think again. Uh, maybe your screw up really was really, really bad. Terrible, unthinkable, beyond ugly, beyond immoral. Maybe, just maybe, you pawned your wife off as your sister to have him sleep with another guy because you were afraid. That'd be bad, right? And then maybe you did it twice. No, it's disgusting. Oh, you're terrible. But here's what I tell you what to do in a situation like that. Admit it. Okay, this is really bad. This is really bad. Trust God's character. Ask for forgiveness. Receive forgiveness. For God's sake, work on your marriage. And then learn from your past mistakes so you don't keep on repeating it the way Abraham did. And once you've done that, get back in the game. Get off the couch and get back in the game. Don't buy this lie that you got to be 100% healthy before you can start getting involved in things again and, and, and doing the work of the kingdom. However terrible it is, however ugly, however putrid, uh, God's not done with you. Your family might be done with you. You may have some friends who are done with you. Maybe they're written you off too many times. Can't, it's done. But God is never done with you. Get back in the game. Serve. Amen. You know, the, 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 the devil will jump on your back. He's the accuser. He's called the accuser for a reason because he accuses. And he'll say, look what you did, you disgusting, putrid piece of crap. And, and you have to pay for this. Uh, you're never allowed to have joy again after what you did. You're never allowed to have peace again, not what you did. You're never allowed to be confident again, not after what you did. You're never allowed to have a healthy relationship again, not after what you did. And he'll pound you down, pound you down, pound you down because he wants to take you out of the game. And if that is you, if that is you, it's time where you, you got to know what's true and what's not. And what's not true is what's going on in your head. So you make a choice. I'm not going to listen to the voice in my head. I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus, all right? You fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't trust your brain. Your brain is damaged. Trust, trust Jesus Christ. Because see, here's the thing. We sing this song, Jesus paid it all. And, and it's a great song to sing. And the reason we sing it is because Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. He, he, all the consequences, all the death consequences of sin, he absorbed within himself. And, 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 and if, he, if he paid it all, that means there's nothing more to pay. What are you doing doubling down on paying for your crimes? Huh? You're, you're putting yourself in double jeopardy. You're, you're paying out of twice. Stop it. And you're insulting the cross. You're saying, oh, Jesus, sorry, your suffering wasn't adequate. i got to suffer more. In the Middle Ages, they used to just flog themselves with these whips and stuff. Nowadays, we just kind of beat ourselves with our thoughts. Or some people still physically harm themselves. But there's no point in doing that. And so it, you, you took a hit. You brought it on yourself, perhaps, and, and you're in a bad, bad place. You feel like you're dead. You're out of the game. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Because yes, yes. not only did he die for you, but, but see, he took a hit. He knows that it's to take a hit. He took the hit of the century, of the universe. He, he, he took all the hits of the world. He bore all the sin of the world. And man, you talk about the devil jumping on someone's back. He was devoured. He was devoured. That, that's part of what he did on the cross. Uh, and he was killed, and he was taken out of the game. For a little while. 
But then the Spirit of God raised him from the dead. And the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. Paul says that. You've got in you resurrection power. You've got, the spirit in you is the spirit of get back in the gameness. It's the spirit of get up off your feet. It's the spirit of with me, with God, all things are possible. You get back in the game. Don't stay out of it too long. Uh, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's like with swimming. I'm told that when, when a child falls in the pool and almost drowns, you, of course, take them out of the pool, make sure they're safe and get them okay. But as soon as possible, you put them back in that, that, that pool. I don't even know if that's true, but I've always heard it. I'm not asking anyone to try to test this on your children. <laughs> but but I, something similar truth in, in a spiritual way applies to us. Where, where when you take a hit and, and you're down and, and uh, you know, the, the enemy's on your back, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a, a time where you, where you maybe just need to heal. You've got to get out of the pool. You've got to be safe. But as soon as possible, get back in that game. Get back in that pool. Get back in the ministry. Start serving. Look around, there's opportunities to serve all over the place. There's a million here at the church, or you can go to a homeless shelter, or on your neighborhood, or wherever. But start serving, start doing what the kingdom's supposed to do. Start living like Jesus. And see, there's a, there's a dimension of your growth and healing that won't happen until you do that. It's like in a hospital, you know, you can lay on your back for a while, but you gotta start walking around, or you're gonna atrophy. So also, get, don't buy the lie that you've got to be totally healthy before you can start serving. As soon as you can start serving, start serving. And that will start flexing your, your spiritual muscle. It also is the best way to fight depression. There's all sorts of proof of that. Serving builds gratitude, which is happiness, all right? So it, 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 it changes your posture. But it also is the best way to get the devil off your back. The most vulnerable person on the planet is someone who's idle. Sitting around, licking your wounds, sorry for yourself, regretting your past, living in that sorrow thing. Man, you are just, you, you just pray for the enemy. Uh, no, don't, 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 don't just be sitting around licking your wounds. As soon as you can, get back in that game because God is not done with you. He's not done with you, praise God. Best thing you can do for your healing, get back into service. Get up. We sometimes say that the only difference between a sinner and a saint is that the saint just keeps getting back up. And there's a lot of truth of that. Uh, you know, a couple, I don't know if you know this, but we've got, and I, I feel so blessed with this, we've got a large, uh, a, a large number of people who are, who are in recovery, who are coming from halfway houses. And I want to say, we love you people. We love you people. I, thank, I feel honored that you're, that you're coming here. I, I spoke with one of these guys um, three, three and a half months, three months ago or so, and, and, and he told me he was in, in this recovery program, and I asked him how long he's been sober, and he said, well, this time it's, it's three months. Um, the last time I went, 18 and a half months, that's my longest. So I said, this is, apparently this is not your first rodeo. And he kind of looked down on the ground and was sort of embarrassed. And he said, it's my 13th. But he looked kind of ashamed of that, and I, I said to him, you don't need to be embarrassed by that. Don't look down on that dude. You got back up. You got back up. That's the only thing that matters. You're in the game. You're here to take, go another round, you know? You're going to take another swing. They thought you were out at number seven, and they certainly rolled you off at eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, but here you are. Define the odds, man. You've taken a pummeling a bunch of times, but you're back here. You're back in there. You're standing up. And that's all that matters. The pre previous 12 were rehearsals, right? You know, they, they were those, this is the one where we're going to knock that dude on his butt to continue the boxing analogy, all right? You get back in the game. The saint is simply a person who gets back up because God is not done with you. It's kind of a kingdom principle. Now, we commit to keeping covenant with God. And in the community of God's people, we try to do that. But when we stumble, when we fall, whether small, whether big, whatever, uh, you, have, you trust in God's character. You ask for forgiveness, get forgiveness, repair whatever needs to be repaired, learn from the past, and get back in the game. Amen? Amen? Amen. One other aspect of the story I want to bring out. And that's this. You know, when, when, when God first called Abraham, he, was, he and Sarah were already at an age where conceiving children would be difficult. Um, and so when Abraham hears, hey, you're going to have a child, and then you're going to have many, many descendants, he's probably thinking, like, oh, okay. Um, tonight I'll take my annual shower and use, get my Viagra, and, and, and Sarah and I will get a little frisky, and we're going to conceive a child, and in nine months, we begin Operation Mustard Seed. Uh, he's, he's thinking, like, this is going to be right now, right? Didn't quite go down like that, because God waited a couple more decades till they're way, way past childbearing age before he gave them this child, and that was to teach them a lesson about trusting him. But God clearly is not in a hurry on things. And then Isaac is born, and then we have several generations of the descendants of Abraham. But then they all end up for 400 years in Egypt as slaves. 400 years. Now think about this. 
Imagine you're a slave at year 300. 300 years, all of your ancestors have known of slavery. And slavery in Egypt ain't no picnic. You're working under 100 degrees. Morning to night, 100 degree weather, 120 degree weather, I would have died so quick. And you're working at the lashes of the cruel Egyptian guards and you're maybe farming or a lot of folks are just building those fancy tombs for those pharaohs that are so important, those pyramids there. It took several generations of laborers to build those things. And so your father and your great-grandfather have been building the same pyramid. That's the purpose of your life. And you're looking at your miserable existence 300 years into the slavery thing and you've got to be thinking, where's the promise? Where's the blessing? Where's the great nation? Huh? We're supposed to be a great nation. We're supposed to be a blessing to everybody. The only ones we're blessing right now are the Egyptians and that's because they're forcing us to. And what about cursing those who curse us? How come the Egyptians aren't being cursed? I mean, he's heard stories of all this passed down to him, but he's got to be wondering, is this true? Is this true? Because at this point in history, there's no evidence, no evidence that God's going to fulfill this promise. Because he's got no idea what's really going on here. He's got no idea that he's part of this people that are going to bring forth the Messiah and that the promises of Abraham are actually going to be fulfilled in this Messiah and then all who believe in him. He has no clue about any of that. He's ignorant. And yet as a Jew, he's called to trust that Yahweh is faithful. He's called to trust in the character of God. He's called to trust that somehow, some way, God knows what God is doing and that his promises will be fulfilled even if we don't see them. I, I think, I, honestly, I think we're very much in a similar situation. Um, you know, we, I've got a lot more reasons for believing in Jesus than, than that slave ever had for believing in Yahweh. I mean, I've got my historical and philosophical and existential reasons for believing Jesus is Lord. And, and we all have, if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit, which is a foretaste of things to come. And once in a while, praise God, the kingdom breaks through and we see miracles. So we do see evidence that God's up to stuff. We do see some of that. But look around the world, honestly. Watch the news. It, the state of things. Aren't you a little bit disappointed? I just, it's like, like, I kind of thought, like, God, what are you up to here? Um, because, it, you know, you read the New Testament, and Jesus' death was supposed to change everything, right? And they thought it was going to happen very, very soon. They're always talking about the soon coming, this building of the kingdom. It's going to happen within our lifetime. They all believe that. In fact, the early Christians, if you read the later letters of the New Testament, they're already getting disappointed. Like, what is it taking so long? We're getting martyred here. You know, I thought the cross was supposed to change everything. Um, and, and, and so they're asking those questions. And if they were disappointed 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead, I, I feel justified being a little bit disappointed 2,000 years later. It's like, come on already! You know, yeah, thank God for the reasons we have for believing and for the miracles we sometimes see and, and, and for the Holy Spirit, but the world seems pretty much the same as the world's always been. What difference has the cross really made? The last 50 years, we've done a good job of fighting uh, starvation, getting people out of poverty and, 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 and with medicine and health and stuff. But that's more about medicine than it is about the cross. Uh, human nature seems just about as bad as it's ever been. You know, we still are warmongers. We still believe the myth of redemptive violence. We, uh, the war drums are always playing. They're always in the background. Fights breaking out here and there. It seems to me that, 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 I mean, sometimes the world seems like it's spinning out of control. Animosity is on the rise, and racism is on the rise all over the globe, and xenophobia on the rise, fear on the rise, and this, this, this toxic venom everywhere. And you can ask, sometimes feel like, God, you're not winning here. You're not winning. And the global warming, and we can't get the collective world to do anything about it, and I could list a million other problems. And so we're very much like the slave. Like, okay, Where's the evidence of this? But see, like that slave, we are called in the situation that we find ourselves, we're called to have faith. Uh, we're in the situation of a slave, slave because we, like that slave, we honestly, folks, we don't have a clue how this thing's going to wrap up. We're not really sure. We know it's going toward, this whole thing's heading towards the kingdom of God, and that would be wonderful. But the how and, and the when, we don't know. You've got some biblical images, apocalyptic images in the Bible, but basically what they're all saying is, expect, a, expect an extreme makeover here any minute. <laughs> That's all it means. It's going to be spectacular, mind-blowing, world-changing. But we don't know anything about the details, when or how. And if you find somebody who thinks they know something about the details, or find a book that thinks they know something about the details, the how and the when, I encourage you to not waste any money on that book or time in that conversation because the thing is, those folks are engaging in at least borderline divination, trying to know things that we're not supposed to know, and B, they have 
in history, 100% inaccurate track record. <laughs> They've never once been right, so I wouldn't bet that this one's going to be right either. We don't know. For all we know, this, this thing could wrap up in a way that is more surprising to us than, than that slave would have been surprised to find out how Abraham's promises were fulfilled. We just don't know. We, we just, but, but, but like that slave in ancient Egypt, we, we are called to trust. We're called to trust God's character. In a sea of ambiguity, we're called to trust that somehow, some way, God's promises are, are going to be fulfilled. We're called to trust and to have faith is to have a vision. Have a vision for the beauty of what the world will be like when the kingdom fully comes and the beauty of what you're going to be like when the kingdom fully comes. And our job is to try to be that in the present, to put as much on display of the future now as we can, to be a preview of, 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 uh, and a foretaste of, of what is coming. We're, tr we're called to trust that God is working all over the place, that God is still in control. doesn't control d details and disasters, but, but he's steering this whole ship, and, and, and he's not going to let it, it implode on itself until it's time for it to implode on itself. And so you trust that God will win in the end. You trust that you're on the side that, that, that comes out victorious. And you trust, even if you don't fully understand, you trust that your covenant-keeping with God makes a difference in this world. Uh, as you keep covenant, as you're rightly related to God, as you, as, that, as you aspire towards that, then you become rightly related to yourself and to others in the earthly animal kingdom, and God's will gets done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, you trust that however much you've screwed up in your life, however broken you are, whatever wrongs you've done or wrongs that have been done to you, whatever lies you've believed and internalized, Whatever the case may be, however ugly, that God isn't done with you. God wants to use you. You're never too broken for God to discard. He doesn't throw away trash. He redeems trash. Praise God. And by the way, we're all trash. <laughs> Hallelujah. He brings beauty out of ashes so we can wear forgiveness like a, a crown. I don't know how it all fits together. I don't need to know. I just thank God that God's God and he wants to use a loser like me. Praise God. And so we're called just to do all we can in everything we do. I see the church is sort of laying down the runway strip for Jesus to come and kind of land with his Jesus 747 or whatever. <laughs> Lear jet, I suppose. Uh, no, he'll probably be on a donkey. Uh, fly, flies down a run We're preparing a runway strip for a donkey. How's that? No, we're, we're, we're doing about the business of the kingdom, laying the groundwork for what is to come, and we're not even sure how that's going to look. But praise God, we get to do it. We get to do it. So keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, you guys. Don't get discouraged by this long period of time. It fits God's pattern. You know, he's never in a hurry to do anything, right? Uh, he, he's, he's always been, he's always been, he will be. And so any length of time is, is almost infinitesimal for him. It's just a nanosecond. So, so just trust God, have faith, and be faithful. God wants to use you, you know, if, ands, and buts. So get back in the game in Jesus' name. Would you stand? <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, if you're here this morning and have any need that could use prayer, a sickness or finances or relationship, whatever, I encourage you to come up here and our prayer teams will be over here by the stairs and I encourage you to, to pray with them. And if you're here this morning and you're not a devoted follower of Jesus, but there's something saying, gosh, I should check this out, come on up here and talk to these folks and love to explain to you what it is to get started on a walk with, with, with Jesus Christ. So folks, as we leave here, can we do it as the children of, 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 of Abraham? Father Abraham had many sons, and every one of them was screw-ups, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just keep marching on. God bless you guys. Go out and love your neighbors. Hi, everyone. Kevin Callahan here again with a quick reminder. If you or someone you know may be interested in our School of Missional Apprenticeship this fall, you can find out more at whchurch.org slash SOMA. Again, that's whchurch.org slash S-O-M-A. We'd love to have you join us.